。エジプトのエゴテープの最初の章、第3章、見てみましょうか。そこでしょ、聖書説教者、ルーク、one in which we have two conditions, the first part and the second condition. And the second example, if we look at your context, we will have a look at how we can help out the school in the next year. Let's have a look at how we can implement this in a simple context and how we can help out the local church. Let's say that we want half our congregation to be in either block one followed by block two, and the other half of our congregation to be in either block two followed by block one. A simple way of doing this is we actually can look at the subject number as we would at first when we see them. If it's an odd number, we'll give them the order block one followed by block two. If it's an even number, we'll give them block two followed by block one. To demonstrate this, we've got a simple experiment here set already. This experiment, we are at the stage in the structure now where we have all our participants. We have Britain Waite here in Space Bar Super starting. We then have block number one, which just contains one particular cell, block two, we've got one there called MSU, and one cell in the particular name, block one, block two. We then have some second block instructions here in the same particular block one. Block two, we open the space bar super, and then we start block two, and block two is followed by one more cell, MSU, followed by block two. Then we have a good guy number of cells, and then we have a wait for the space bar to make it click. So if I run this experiment right now, Very crude way of thinking about this is to actually take the second verse of the script and literally just move around the order of the blocks so that some of the blocks are actually here and then some of the blocks are actually uh, down here. And that will create the opposite order here. Sorry, is that better?、Uh, that will recreate the opposite、uh, order for us. But then we'd have to remember to open up each of the different blocks and so on. Here is run this block one here if the subject has the use of cell right in the instance, and run this block two here only if the subject has the read cell right read the cell. We can flip that over in the second pairing. So run this block one here only if the subject has the use of even.
first time up here, uh, it's gonna, if you've got identical to print, it's gonna go flat down and ignore what you print. So if I come down here and flip those two over, it's gonna ignore them. Uh, it's easy then to fix this, so I've got that blue color button locked on. Just a little way through this. If you've got even, uh, sorry, odd numbers to print, so we have stuck to print three, we come down to block one. Because we've got the odd numbers to print, it will run to block one. However, it won't run to block two because it's the first block that's been printed. Good. So we've got the second block of block two now. Then we'll get block one won't be run because we've got the odd numbers to print. We'll get block two to print four. Imagine now we've got stuck to block two, which is obstructing the solar flare. So block one being ignored, we've got block one being ignored again, so we'll ignore that as well. We've got block one being odd, however block two will be ignored as well. So we'll ignore that as well. So to do a quick demonstration of that, we'll flip that to one. This will give us the order block one followed by block two, followed by block one. Try one out now with stuck at block two, which will give us less than one. Next block. So we've got block four now, we'll just have block two followed by block one. So we've got block one followed by block one, followed by block two, followed by block three. That gives us a nice simple way of printing out our first print block followed by our block two. Let's say, for example, we're printing out three blocks um, because they would have had to be printed in order of block one. That would be that stuck at block one gets the block order one, two, three. Stuck at block two gets the order two, three, one. And stuck at block three gets the order four, five, two. Stuck at block four is the restart block as well, so we'll just have stuck at block four. Now, because we've got more than two blocks here, we can't use separate colors separate block numbers or any values to help us with confusion. That works fine if you've only got two block numbers, but when there's three or more blocks to follow, it can be a little bit tricky. So permanent is what we're going to use for block three. So for permanent block one, we'll actually use a bit of a different trick so we can get most of our blocks out. So I'll do a demonstration of this using the uh, feedback window that I have up here uh, in the core window right here. Another little rusty trick basically is to think of it like the remainder from uh, the video. So if we have a true modulo 3, which I'll say is three divided by 3 is 0 minus 1, which is negative 0. If we have 1 divided by 3, which would be 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. If we have 0 minus 3, which is the remainder of our number. In this case, we have 2, 2 divided by 3, and 2 divided by 3, which is the remainder of 2. If we use 4 for example, that would actually either be 1 divided by 1, which would be negative 1, which is the remainder. Uh, as you can see, we're actually only got three numbers that are coming out of this block of our vision. So we've got 0, which is obviously negative 1, 3. We've got 1, which is negative 1, negative 3. We've even got 2, which is negative 2, which is the remainder. And we can use these three values to determine which block it is that we want to print out. Now in Python, the modulo function is kind of uh, extended a little bit. So we can then say something like block 1 modulo 3, which is the output 1. Block 1 modulo 3, block 1 divided by 3, 0 minus 1. We can use 2 modulo 3, which is negative 2. Block 3 divided by 3, 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. Put 4 in. got this little cycle of block order going from 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, all the way to block order 1, which is odd. But we can actually exploit this to tell what that block order is going to be. So let's have a look at how we can actually implement this inside of our program. Let's have a look at the module. 
right? I've got a simple gun open deck already, which uh, contains the third mini game and a wooden piece of kit. It contains the kit that I've been having in here. It takes the form of a list of characters and statements, and basically what you're doing here is looking for the correct position of the deck. And so if the dice deck, the top deck over there, is on the one, then it's advisable for you to run D1, D6, D0, D2, D3, D4, D5, and D6. We'll talk a little bit about D1, D2, and D3 later. First of all, let's have a look at the actual character deck itself. Subject number is a variable, so it's not a deck. The fact that it has the name is a function of the deck. But in the actual online script deck deck, we can't actually tell what the subject number is of the deck. Instead, what you have to do is use the set code here, the same set code that makes the this experiment, and go and get the variable for the subject number. That will return the number of the subject number, which will then return the module of the number of your experiment you want to run. It does also get a list of that subject here. However, if it does not match one, let's say the subject, subject has a two, a two or a three, as we saw earlier on, in fact a two, we'll have to come down to the next statement, which is else if the same bit of that letter stick here, but this time doesn't equal two. So the subject has to come up with the module, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D1. I really want to write these, so I haven't kept them on this little piece of paper, but else these two conditions matches or not equal the result of the subject here. So here I've got two, then just write D1 or D3, D4, D5, D6. This is actually the position of that subject number that matches the letter stick here. So let's have a look at what this D1, D2, and D3 actually do. You might have guessed they stand for block 1, block 2, and block 3. The 0, 1, 2 bit, which is back in the set code, actually indicates which order the next block is in spite of which block is blocked first. In all three cases, we've never got set to value of zero, so the first block is the first block blocked. So in case here, the subject has been blocked one, block four, block seven, and so on, the first block has been blocked is block one, block block one. The subject has a two, the first block is blocked is block one, block four, two, the second block is blocked is block one, block four, two, and block three. Then the one indicates the second block, third block is blocked. The reason we use 0, 1, 2 in the set code is to help you with the template style of the deck. Then we also have to set these values uh, for the experiment deck, because otherwise we're not actually going to get the result that we want to see. In fact, what we want to do is we want to set the sixth value, which is the one that matches the zero, as the subject number that matches the zero. The reason for doing this is if you actually match the one matching the zero, it will match up with the one that matches the zero. So to make them across the experiment, they're available across the experiment as the entire experiment, not the set. The variable D1 is the value of D1, D2, D3, and D4. We'll have to make sure that these values are the same as the set as well. So just to briefly recap this particular screen, if we run this entire script, the subject number is number 1. The very, very first condition is set to equal to 5, so the subject number of block 0, 2 will indeed equal 1. Then we'll set D1 to 0, D2 to 0, and D3 to 2. However, if we have the subject number to 2, we won't get the first condition back as we'll get the second condition. In fact, the subject number will actually be number 2, not 1, 3, it'll be 2, in which case we'll set D1 to 2, D2 to 0, and D3 to 1. And in all other cases, D1 is set to D2 is set to D3 is set to. And then finally, we just make sure that the set is the same as the subject number that we set. So let's take a look at what the rest of the experiment is actually doing. After we've determined what the block order is going to be in the first instance, we have some instructions given in this fashion. Uh, and then we've got one sent for the next experiment. We then have this new project called Main Mix. It doesn't seem to contain very much, 
Yeah. It really is. It's just the size of it. And um, it's just the reason she set up this place is because what they want to have happen is to run through three particular blocks of this dam. Mm. So that all the dirt and mud would come through blocks and blocks and blocks. They consider mainly to be sort of the control blocks that they have in place to, to sort of manage the construction of this particular dam. Uh, and by setting the block up this way, it's going to run the city because it's main street and it's three blocks. It's not going to be a big problem. You can see we've got three blocks set up at the moment. We've got the block here, block here, block here, and the block here. Uh, these are set up just to display a simple number one and two. So if you put one down, it's the other two. Block one, block one. Uh, block two, block two. Block three, block three, block three. All three blocks are on the same trial sequence to display the set number of one and two. So it's just to Towards the end of the experiment, I did buy my board and I did put some uh, cardboard on it and then I had to come back and put some uh, cardboard on the top and then put some uh, cardboard on the bottom. I thought today we had the infamous counterbalance thing. I don't think that's going to happen today. I'd like to have a look at what happens when we run this place down the bottom. We have main loop contains three cycles, so it's just from main sequence to three cycles. Main sequence contains three blocks, block one, block two, block three. Each of which is going to display a number one and two, a number two, a number one, and a number one. Bang. So what we should see is that the blocks come out next turn, followed by the message, this is block one, this is block two, this is block three. It's running through main sequence for both of them. Then, because we're running through main loop three times, we like to get this is block one, this is block two, this is block three, a second time. And then we'll get it a third time. What we're going to do is basically message it, put it on, and that's the end of block one and two. Then we'll get our goodbye message, and that's the end. So I thought we'd just run this one out now, and we'll get some uh, cardboard on the top. So there's our instructions. This is just block one, the first time round we'll see it do that in the main loop. Block two, block three. Then we get block one again. Thirdly, block three, block two, block three, so on with that message. The next thing we need to do then is to present block one, block two, block three all in one block cycle sequence. What we basically want to do is change the values in red to sort of display a red block in the top and a red block in the bottom. We want to put some conditions in there so it's only run block one the first time round and not block two the first time round. This is the reason that I came back to this question at the beginning about why we use the value 0, 1, and 2 to present the number theory. The reason is that this particular thing is run through three times. Every time it's run, there are variables which are counted to run the sequence. This value will increment every time one of these cycles runs. Now the thing is, that the very first time it runs one of these cycles, it will only count one of these as having a value 0. The second time it runs it, it will have a zero. The third time it runs it, it will have a 2. This is the reason we usually count the 0, 1 and 2 as having a value 0, 1 and 2 as having 0. So what we want to basically say in our instructions is that if the count in our sequence is 0, we need to look at what particular block in our board we've got and then run that block as we do each other block in the um, sequence. Now we don't want to have to use any more arbitrary code here, so we can't have to sort of run the block as if it's not here. We can actually put some arbitrary code in here later. If we're going to put arbitrary code in here, we have to have some sort of reason um, for this in here. I've actually got a couple of blocks in here which I can show you. We have the equal sign, which is spread up there across the left hand side, basically it's block one. Equal sign, so it indicates that it's affecting all three sequences and that it's up in code in here. We're then going to get the value of V1, which is that value in there. And we're going to see if that's equal to 
the uh, value of the pound to the pound figure. It's quite easy to explain this when we talk in the terms of the pound here. If we go back to the pound of reference and uh, the dollar, and if we think of the case where we're trying to set this as one, B1 is going to be set to zero. This means Whenever uh, B1 has been set to zero and a pound to pound sequence is also zero, then we want to drop the pound to pound value. In the case of uh, B2, for example, uh, on the first pound value of this sequence, the pound to pound is set to zero. Where B2 is actually set to one, so this is a different value. And likewise, this one here is set to three, the pound to sequence is set to zero, and this is set to two. Don't want to drop the pound to pound value of the sequence in this sequence. However, on the second pound to this point in the sequence, the pound to this sequence is now set to value 1. That will basically mean then that the first drop B1, which was evaluated as being 0, and the first drop of the pound to pound sequence, which was evaluated as 1, will no longer be true. The drop down will no longer happen. However, if we look at first drop B2, B2 has been set to 1. Our pound to pound sequence, the second pound to three, is indeed going to be set to one. So this can be considered a set value in the method of reference. If we look at the third example here, first drop B3 is set to two. Does it equal the pound to pound sequence, which is the second pound to zero, one? The answer is no, it will not equal the pound to pound sequence. Then the final time we run through, we'll be dropping the value of B1, which we set to zero again, but this time the pound to pound sequence will be two. And we'll need to set the pound to pound value of the sequence. B2 is set to 1, we'll drop it to 2 here. However, B3 will probably be set to 2, but the answer is no, the pound to pound sequence will not equal the value of B3. As a result of this, it means that every time we go through that math sequence, only one of the blocks is going to be correct, which is set to 2. For example, uh, the value that we set to 2 here is not equal to the pound to pound sequence. So if we compare that, the reason we use these more is set to 2, but we're actually referring to the very fact here that the pound to pound sequence is indeed going to be set to 2 and not equal to 3. So I think a copy and paste of these indicates that we need to drop the pound to pound sequence value of the sequence. blocks are only going to run if these conditions are satisfied and they are both equal and true. So on the first time round we run, we get what we want. On block one, the pound to B1 is set to value zero, B2 is zero. If we look at the pound to pound value zero, the row set to pound is set to two, so the pound sequence will be set to two, not the pound to pound sequence value of the sequence. The same can be also said for block two. So the first time we run through, Second time we run through, we'll check that the sequence is the same as the pound to value of 1. That will happen when we check that the sequence is block 2 here. It won't happen. However, finally, the third time we run through, B3 will be set to pound 2, which will make sense here. The pound to pound sequence will be set to 1. So let's just try running this by way of example. Uh, we can test it this way. This should give us the instruction followed by this is block 1, this is block 2, this is block 3, and then we'll test it by way of example. method.
So that's how we can uh, implement a more co uh, complex system uh, with, with like minimal uh, variables. It may seem a little complicated to uh, to actually implement it in a in a real system, but essentially what we've been doing here is using some of the rebuilt uh, variables that were provided by the developers to actually make it look as if it's done right. So these are the tests and improvements that we've made. Um, and so we've looked at the which samples are being used, the style of uh, which blocks are being used, and how they're being stored. And that is also how we turn the win rate for the test we're trying to do into a win rate. So hopefully that gets started thinking about how you use this more complex system uh, in your own uh, development.